something to say. Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of Project Shadow. My name's Charlie. You might know me better as sci-fi fantasy writer C.E. Dorset, And this episode is coming out a little bit late because I got sick over the weekend and yeah, things. So I'm sorry about that and hopefully that won't happen for a very long time. Anywho, as usual, today is Monday, and so we're talking about the latest episode of Star Trek Discovery Project Daedalus. This was an interesting episode of Discovery, and it's one that I feel was hampered in some ways because of how they've handled the cast up to this point. But all in all, I enjoyed the episode. I have a lot of theories as to what it may portend for the future. And yeah, I don't... I hate to say this because, you know, I feel like it's a cop-out every time. It was a good episode. It was continuing in the line of interesting stuff that they're doing on the show. But I don't feel like I can talk about much of it without going into spoilers. So if you have not seen... Project Daedalus, and you do not want to be spoiled, spoilers will be incoming in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay. So, in this episode, we are taking a journey with the crew of the Discovery. <sighs> All the way to the headquarters of Section 31. Admiral Patar is in this one again. We get to spend some time with her. And Admiral Cornwell shows up and is there like we expected from the last episode. So, yeah. I, I have little to no feelings about these characters. And that's part of the problem. Cornwell, I'm kind of okay with because we did get to spend some time with her last season as her story interwove with both Lorca and the horrible Klingon thing that they did. But again, I don't feel that I get to know her very well. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to start with two issues that I had with the episode and then move on from there. One, I... This episode very heavily relies on us having an emotional connection to a character that they have not allowed us to have an emotional connection with, and that just, uh, it really, like, okay, so Commander Arium, we finally get backstory for her character. She is not a robot. She is a human who was injured in a um, shuttlecraft accident and was basically put back together because we have the technology. And as we already know, she has been possessed by the technology thingy from the time vortex that downloaded itself and blah, 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 blah. Okay. Because we don't get to spend a lot of time with the characters that aren't Michael Burnham, mm, yeah, it this felt a lot more like an episode of Star Trek where we're introduced to a new cast member for the episode who, of course, is going to die in course of the episode. And those can be impactful. And I do think that the relationship worked in this case. I, I think that they pulled off all the beats that they needed to though rather ham-fistedly because we had not spent any time with Arium, so they had to quickly give us her backstory, get us to understand who and what she is, um, find out that she has very similar problems to the robot in Next Gen, which is a Netflix animated cartoon movie thingy that was actually pretty good. 
Um, and has to kind of select which of her memories she keeps every week because her memory storage is finite and she can't hold on to everything. And that was an interesting touch and I'm not opposed to it, but I didn't feel as much over her death as I should have because you didn't let me get to know her ahead of time. Like, I remember when Tasha Yar died on Star Trek The Next Generation, and even though that was in the first season, I had gotten to know Tasha, I had gotten to like Tasha, and I had come to expect that, like with all Star Trek, Tasha was a character that was going to be there through to the end. So having Tasha die affected me because I didn't expect it and because I knew her and liked her as a character. Now, Arium has been there for a long time on the show. She's been in the background. Only recently did I get a concept of what her name was. And it wasn't until this episode that I found out that she was human. And while it was sad and watching Tilly and Michael have to deal with the issues surrounding her death, it was kind of like watching Decker die in Star Trek First Contact. No, it wasn't Decker. What was his name? Hawk. Die in First Contact. I didn't know this person. I didn't have a long history with this person. And so, okay. And I get that that's the kind of character that traditionally dies, but it made Arium feel more like a red shirt. And it's a problem that Star Trek Discovery has had since its inception because it's actually killed off quite a few bridge characters. But they're all characters that we haven't got to spend any time with get to know and get to have any feels for the only character that that kind of differed for was Culber when he died because they wanted to make a big deal out of the fact that they had a finally had an out gay character on a Star Trek show so we got to spend a little bit of time with him before he acts completely out of character and stupid and gets killed and I'm not rehearsing that if you want to know more about that go back to the episode what have you done Star Trek and uh, yeah, I, I lay into them on that. Okay, so <clears throat> that's problem number one, is it would have meant more to me if I had gotten to know her. Two, and this is going to sound weird, and a lot of people that really aren't into Star Trek might differ with me, and people that are might as well, but I don't think Spock was emotional enough in this episode. Now, that may sound weird, but follow me here. If we're taking the cage as canon, and that's always been kind of a question because we knew the parts that were included in the menagerie kind of were, and we've talked a lot about canon and canon being used as a cudgel, but the Spock that was portrayed in that episode was a much more emotional character than the Spock that we met in the original series. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that Gene Roddenberry had yet to decide that Vulcans had given up all emotion for sake of logic. So the Spock that we meet in the cage, he smiles, he gets angry, he yells, he has a lot more emotional response. And this Spock, played by Ethan Peck, and I think played well by Ethan Peck, because I think he's trying to thread an impossible needle here of making people happy that he's not either Zachary Quinto or Leonard Nimoy. But I kind of would like, if we're getting this kind of bridge between the cage and the original series. It would be more interesting for me if he was allowed to have a little bit more emotionality. 
Now, it was nice to see him kind of lose his temper and smack the um, 3D chess board the way he did. That worked for me. I'm okay with that. But I, I want to see Spock get angry. I want to see Spock show emotion. And I want to see him start dedicating himself to the path of logic that we see on the original series. That remember, he doesn't go through his culinar till the first movie. His purging of all emotion. He doesn't do that until the beginning of the motion picture. But those are just two minor gripes. Most of the episode I rather enjoyed. And again, I think it would have been better and more impactful if I knew Arium prior to this episode and she didn't come across as an extra that was added to the episode for sake of being the one who died. Okay. Now, as far as theories go, this episode, again, I keep going back to the novelization for um, the motion picture. And I really feel like people need to read that to get discovery. I just have this weird feeling that when they were deciding to go back to the roots of Star Trek, they went, well, Gene wrote a novel and they read the novel. And a lot of the ideas seem to be getting pulled from that novel. One of the things, and I've talked about this on the podcast before, but one of the things that Gene talks about in that book is a schism that's happening on Earth between what he refers to as the new humans and the, I believe, traditionalists. And this probably isn't the way... This probably doesn't break down in the way that you think I'm. it would it would if you didn't read the book. Kirk and Spock and them would be traditionalists in that the traditionalists believe that they should keep some of the old things alive. So they would actually read actual printed books instead of reading everything off of a screen. They would, oh, I don't know, do things like rock climbing and horseback riding and stuff like that, that we see Kirk and Picard and many of the characters that are prominent in Star Trek doing. The new humans, for the most part, have incorporated technology into every aspect of their life. To the point where, as the book says, many of them have had it incorporated into them. So Arium and Dittmer appear, because again, we have no, I have no reason at this point to believe that Lieutenant Dittmer is not a human with augmentation, because they have given me no reason to believe that, that they would actually fit more strongly into the new human category than the traditionalist, whereas the other characters that we've met are fairly solidly in the traditionalist camp in that some of them still know how to cook. We see them reading, you know, Michael Burnham, for example, reading an actual physical copy of Alice in Wonderland and through the looking glass throughout the story. We see, you know, um, Stamets and his interest in gardening. These are more traditionalist things. And I feel like this show is actually taking that idea from the novel and expressing it in a very interesting way. So what we've learned in this episode is that basically section 31 at its headquarters has a computer system that all of the intel that they gather gets fed into, and it kind of crunches the numbers and feeds back strategic plans. That is very much a new human concept, if we're using the idea that Gene Roddenberry put forward in the novelization of the motion picture. And I realize a lot of my theories are based on that, but 
you really should read it because I think that that's where they're getting a lot of their ideas for this season from. So with this computer system being what it is and doing what it does, they are in effect turning over their sovereignty to a machine. What we have now learned is for reasons beyond our understanding, the machine has for some reason taken on life or is wanting to. Now, I don't personally believe that this is a man against technology story. I think this is a new humans versus traditionalist humans point of view. Remember, a traditionalist does not reject technology. Kirk is not against the technology that's on the ship. And again, a lot of what's going on in this season is explaining the differences between what we've seen in Discovery Season 1 and what we see in the original series. I believe that a lot of that's going to be a paring down of technology because of the new humans and what it has made technology do. It has made them too vulnerable. So we're going to go back and see a reliance on the tapes. We're going to see the technology change and via retrofit look a lot more like what we're used to in the original series. I'm calling that now. I think I've called it before, but that that's what's going to happen. So in this kind of new human plot, which my personal belief is it is going to spawn an AI. Because remember, okay, let me go back. So the episode is called Project Daedalus. And the reason for that is we learn from Ariam before she dies that they need to find Project Daedalus. Daedalus has two meanings, and I'm going to be overly generous with the writers behind Star Trek Discovery, and this is always a dangerous thing to do because I usually give them way too much credit, but I'm hoping that I'm right on this because then they would at least live up to some of my expectations of them as Star Trek writers. Daedalus, yes, is most well known from the story of him and his son Icarus and their escape from the palace at Canossus when he made wax wings for both of them. That's usually left out of the story. He tells his son not to fly too high or the sun will melt the wax. They escape, his son flies too high, falls into the ocean, and dies. Daedalus does not. Daedalus tries to save his son, he's not capable of it, but he does eventually fly to the shore and escape. Why were they escaping? Okay, Daedalus was hired by the king to make an inescapable labyrinth. That labyrinth is the labyrinth that we find the Minotaur in. Okay. Now, the Minotaur was only defeated because somebody used the magic thread that would let them make a path through the labyrinth that they could then find a way out when Theseus went in to kill the Minotaur. And I think that that's, that's actually the Daedalus story that we're getting here. That... Basically, Section 31 and Project Daedalus is this labyrinth. It is a perfect trap that has been in construction for quite some time that would basically keep them safe. This, of course, being the whole idea of the labyrinth is that enemies of the state would be thrown into the labyrinth and would get lost. This is how the Minotaur gets there. Okay? So having said that, I think that that's the mythological analogy they're going for with this, that this control system was originally designed and is part of Project Daedalus, which we'll eventually learn was a project that was started in the midst of the Klingon War as a way to save them, basically kept giving more and more authority to the machine and more and more latitude to the neural networks within it to come up with solutions. And one of the solutions that the machine ends up making is that non-reliance on machines is part of the problem. 
that if they just would have listened to pure logic, remember the Vulcan hello? They should have just attacked the Klingons right away, shown force, and then not ended up in the war. There's actually a fairly good argument for that if you go back and watch the first two episodes of the pilot. Basically, Michael was right, but because they stopped her from attacking the sarcophagus ship, the war was allowed to occur. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> if the AI were to come to the same conclusion, then the problem was that the traditionalist humans were the problem. This season of Discovery is doing several things. It is, one, explaining away the technological differences between Discovery and the original series and is eventually going to bring us into realignment because they're trying to make people happy, dot, dot, dot. It is also going to explain V'ger to us. I really, truly believe that we are going to learn that the machine at the heart of Project Daedalus is going to be the thing that reconstructs V'ger and s eventually sends it on its path back to Earth. Um, maybe. Not 100% convinced of that, but I, I do have a feeling because that's, again, something that was never explained who did that. So I think that there were, we're going to get some semblance of that, mainly because we see whatever's going on in the time vortex able to affect the probe and make it into a living thing, much like V'ger. Okay? So we're going to get that explained to us this season, and we're going to see the fight between the new humans and the traditionalists come to a head. And that's going to cause a lot of the augmentation to disappear from the humans so that by the time we get to the original series and following, we don't see augmented humans, even, even though that is something that could have been expected. Yeah. This, this season really is starting to feel like prequelitis in that they're trying to explain things away to make fans happy. I, I'm hoping they put more to it than that. I kind of want to see a non-Borg explanation for what's going on with Project Daedalus. We're also probably going to see the destruction and dismantling of Section 31, which is why by the time we get to Deep Space Nine, nobody knows it exists anymore. Um, and that actually makes me happy because it would have been a prominent thing. It would have been something that people would have known about early on because it was in the charter. And by the time we get to Deep Space Nine, it had been dismantled, destroyed, and taken away. And so everybody thinks it's gone. And then this Section 31 series is going to be Philippa Giorgio putting together the secret covert Section 31 that we will eventually meet when we get to Deep Space Nine. A lot of setup this season. That's really what this season boils down to for me. Having said all that, I, I don't think it's the wrong way to go. I don't think we will ever hear the phrase new humans in the series, nor do I think we will hear the phrase traditionalist. We might, but... I don't know that they will go that far. They may give them different names, but I don't know why I'm so fixated on that book. But more and more, it feels like what they're doing with Discovery is using Gene... Ro they're trying to use Gene Roddenberry's words against the fandom that reacted against them so that without actually quoting him so that they can win so that they can have that thing because no matter what you think about brian fuller and we can have discussions about him at some point if you want but he is a really big star trek fan and the idea that he had read that novel does not seem outside the realm of possibility for me and the fact that they brought in rod roddenberry 
who might have brought it up because he would have been at least tangentially familiar with some of his father's thoughts on you know what star trek was and should have been and that's technically why he was brought on board to help with that um yeah i don't know i i'm just i'm fixated with it just because i keep seeing elements of the backstory that kirk gives for himself in that novel which differ from and i'm not gonna say differ differs wrong that are not explicitly stated in the original series because the way, of the way the book hand waves the original series so yeah I, it, it's weird because discovery really seems to be a show wrestling with its own canon and a lot of that has to do with the fact that it is fighting with with itself because it's a prequel I think they would have had better luck if they would have gone with a different plan. Though, when you look at the other Star Trek that was in development, I'm happier that they went with this. Because, you know, it was the, the original idea for the series was it was going to follow Kirk's like great-granddaughter. And she was kind of going to be a spy. And, yeah... She wasn't going to be on a traditional Starfleet ship, and it was just going to kind of be like set in the Star Trek universe, but without any of the things that you would expect. Yeah, that that would not have been a good show, and that would have really enraged fans if that's the way that they would have gone. But fortunately or unfortunately, that's not the way that they went with the series. This episode was more than anything else. A serious setup episode. We see Spock getting in touch with his humanity in a way that he is starting to enjoy. So we are going to see a bit more emotional Spock going forward. I'm pretty sure of that. His relationship with Michael. I understand it being strained. But I don't know. We'll see. We'll see where that goes. It, it does justify my thoughts of, like, he just doesn't like his family, and that's why we've never heard about Michael, and it, why the crew didn't know that Sarek was his father until Amanda said so on the original series. And the massive regrets that Sarek had on the next gen about his relationship with Spock. I think we're going to get to see more of that, and... As long as it doesn't get too soap opery, uh, you know, too soap opera e, I'm okay with that. I'm also expecting that whatever is going on is going to render the spore drive permanently inoperable, because yet again we've seen Stamets trying to repair it and being unable to. I thought the spore drive would have been out of the question after they saved Culper and found out that they were basically tearing giant holes into an alien ecosystem by using it. I thought that would have ruled it out, but what do I know? I, I just talk about this stuff for reasons, I guess. Anywho, it was a good episode. I think it's setting a lot of stuff up. I do believe that we're going to get to see the creation of a new type of humanity. I, I would be shocked if we hear the phrase, the new humans but we should I, I really feel like we should but only time will tell if we actually go there the next episode is titled the red angel so maybe that's the episode we find out what it is and yeah and then the episode of that is called perpetual infinity and then we don't know for the rest of the season remember this series only the season only has 14 episodes in it we have now watched uh, let's see nine of them so we're we're getting to the end 
I don't know. The, the, this episode had more potential than it was able to deliver on just because we didn't know Arium enough. And I'm hoping that we finish, fix that and that we get to know Okoye and, you know, some of, you know, Ditmer and some of the other characters on the sh- ship. I, I just, yeah. Anywho, if you like this episode and <laughs> the app that you're listening to me on allows you to rate either this episode or the podcast in general, please do so. That helps me out a lot. That tells the algorithm to share me with more people. If you have a buck you can send my way down in the show notes, you will see a link that says um, support on Anchor or Anchor Community Support. If you click that, you can give, you can join the project at the $1, $5, or $10 levels. That money helps me do pretty much everything that I do. So thank you to everyone who does that. If you don't have the money, that's fine. Please consider sharing this podcast to others that you think will enjoy it. If you have a question, a comment, or a topic you would like to hear me discuss on the show, you can always hit me up on Twitter. I'm C.E. Dorson on Twitter. I personally would prefer if you go to anchor.fm, download the Anchor app, follow Project Shadow, and click the voice message button and send me a one-minute message. Keep it clean so I can use it on the show so that we can make this our podcast. I think that would be awesome. If you want to find links to my social media accounts as well as everything that I do online, head over to projectshadow.com. Yeah. So much happening this week. Hopefully I can stay healthy through it and get it done. Until next time, don't forget, have the fun. Bye.